How's it going everybody? Chaotic Meatball here and welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be taking on a challenge in a game that I don't normally like playing through all that often, but because I haven't touched it in a good while, I figured we finally blast through a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Heart Gold, but using only rock type Pokemon. Surprisingly enough, there's plenty of encounters to find throughout this game, as Golem, Magcargo, Onix, Sudowoodo, Corsola, Shuckle, Tyranitar, and Rhydon are all available before the Elite Four, technically Pupitar because of level caps, and Aerodactyl, Relicanth, and Armaldo are all available during the Kanto portion of the game. Cray Dilly if you were playing Soul Silver, and Rhyperior once we get Rock Climb, but that's basically just for the red fight. It would be nice if I could use some of the other Rock-type Pokémon available in this game, like Aggron, Solrock, Lunatone, Probopass, and a few others, but all of these are locked behind the Safari Zone once we get into Kanto, and if you've watched my HGSS Oak Challenge, you'll know how stupid the Safari Zone is in this game. Not to mention, Larvitar is already a base encounter there, so I couldn't even do that if I wanted to. Rules of the run are on screen and in the description. Don't forget to like this video and leave a comment below with your guess as to how many attempts this run will take me and how many losses I'll be suffering during that attempt. Knowing me, it'll probably be one attempt due to planning, but something will go wrong during the red fight and I'll lose two Pokemon at the end for no reason, but we'll see. Before we begin though, I want to give a huge shout out to this video sponsor, Manscaped. Manscaped is what I like to call a champion of the people, as when it comes to men's below-the-waist grooming, they offer precision-engineered tools to get the job done on your family jewels without difficulty. They've recently launched their fourth-generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0, backed with the cutting-edge ceramic blade to help reduce grooming accidents, making it much easier to get a clean, below-the-belt shave. Lawnmower 4.0 is a waterproof trimmer as well. It includes a 4000K LED spotlight and has a multifunctional on off switch that can engage a travel lock. So, Manscaped recently sent me the Lawnmower 4.0, and I was actually planning on bringing this with me to a uh, trip, to, and I would have used the travel lock feature, but then Konami cancelled YCS Las Vegas. Guess I'll wait until the end of the pandemic to do anything. However, they also sent me some other cool stuff, including a shirt, some boxers, as well as some products like their 2-in-1 shampoo and conditioner, body wash, crop preserver, and crop reviver. All of these smell pretty similar and make for a nice matching set instead of using clashing scents. They've also got the Weed Whacker, a trimming tool specifically for nose and ear hair, and to top it all off, a nice carrying bag. Oh yeah, forgot to mention that the Lawn Mower 4.0 has wireless charging, using electromagnetic induction to help keep the battery's length of usage longer than wire charging. Pretty sweet stuff, right? Well, I'll cut you a deal. You can join over 4 million men who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer. If you use the code MEATBALL at manscaped.com, you can get 20% off plus free shipping on your order. That is 20% off your order, plus free shipping if you use the code MEATBALL at manscaped.com. I'd pick up some of these products. Your balls will thank you. Now of course, we can't have a starter since none of them evolve into a rock type, but I can take Totodile to help with two things. One, we get an HM user for things like Whirlpool, Waterfall, and Surf later on. And two, our rival will get Chikorita, a pretty tough to contend with Pokemon thanks to my type of choice. Well, not just type of choice, but half of them are either part water or ground types as well, so I'll be in for a world of hurt coming up shortly. I can't get my first encounter until after the first rival battle since Pokeballs aren't available, but once I report, uh, to the local authorities, I'm able to move over to Route 46 to capture Geodude as my actual starter. And immediately, it's time for some EV training. Level 2 Sentrits are the lowest EXP yielding Pokemon that give out attack EVs, 16 EXP each, so I made sure to max out on as many of those as I could without overleveling for Faulkner, getting around 30-ish of them down before heading towards Violet City and into Sprout Tower. None of the Bell Sprouts were actually hard to take down in here, though Elder Lee, yes it's a pun, was a bit stressful, having two Bell Sprouts at level 6 rather than three, but the fact that they both used Growth instead of Vine Whip made it a very easy victory, edging me perfectly for Faulkner. 
He leads off with a level 9 Pidgey, so I just went for Rock Throw, taking a Sand Attack, but I still managed to land it through the Accuracy Deprivation, one-shotting and leaving just Pidgeotto. Rock Throw is still the play, and Geodude resists all of his attacks, so this is no problem. Even through a Roost, I managed to land 3 out of my next 4 Rock Throws, taking him down after taking less than half from a few gusts, winning me the Zephyr Badge. Not too bad, helps that I have the type advantage over this gym as well as the next like I did in the last video. Before we leave Violet City though, we do have a new encounter. Now you might be thinking, oh trade the Bellsprout for an Onyx, why didn't you do that before Faulkner? And that's where you'd be wrong. I can actually get a gift Slugma egg from Primo in the Pokemon Center by inputting a special code based on my trainer ID, which will be considered as a Violet City encounter. Now that I can just grab Onyx over in the Union Cave, and I don't have to worry about dealing with Disobedience, or additional EXP that I don't want seeing as we have more Eevee training to do, I'm planning on building Onyx into a stall Pokemon with a primary focus on the physical side. With that out of the way though, Azalea Town is just on the other end of the cavern, housing the first event with Team Rocket. Sadly though, Proton doesn't put up much of a fight worth talking about, so on to Bugsy it is. Of course, this fight isn't expected to be hard at all. I have Geodude and Onyx. What could possibly go wrong? Well, he leads off with Scyther as I go with Onyx, hitting a rock throw as focus energy comes down, with quick attack following up for a grand total of... 3 damage, before a second rock throw KOs, leveling Onyx up and giving me access to Rock Tomb. Second is Metapod, and this only knows Tackle, so after missing Rock Throw once, I land the next two, taking it down and leaving just Kakuna. Rock Throw is once again a two-shot here, but Kakuna does manage to poison Onyx. Score like half a point, I guess? I still took it down next turn, but hey, at least Kakuna did more damage overall in comparison to Scyther. That's probably the first time that's happened in the history of Bugsy battles. Alas, though, this is where our first attempt ends. Geodude and Onyx are pretty strong Pokemon, but not in the face of a Razor Leaf using Rival. I don't remember where I put that footage, but I will say that on the second attempt, I tried giving my rival Totodile instead of Chikorita, which uh, ended even worse, seeing as Water Gun is special and easily annihilates both Onyx and Geodude. So back to Bayleaf we go for attempt number three, and as they say, third time's the charm. Mostly because I realized I had access to Rock Smash and therefore shards over in the ruins of Alf. There's an NPC in Violet City that trades these shards for berries, naming me things like citrus and lum berries very early, hopefully giving me enough HP to do what I need to do here and get the heck out of dodge. Otherwise, I might allow Slugma to be used, and Lord knows the geniuses down in the comments section would have a field day with that one. Anyway, here I decided to lead off with Onyx, as Boober's lead is Ghastly. By the way, no, that name isn't random, that's actually Magmar's Japanese name. I learned that because we did a little language guessing video over on Beast Coast Pokemon. They're the esports organization that I'm signed to, and I would really appreciate if you guys went ahead and subscribed to that channel. If you guys are able to get that channel to, uh, I don't know, 4,000 subscribers. If we hit 4,000 subscribers by Friday, I'm going to give away five copies, that's right, five copies of Pokemon Legends Arceus over on Twitter. So make sure to open that channel in a new tab and check out some of the videos that I've actually helped put together over there. I recently started this History of Pokemon TCG series that I'm really proud of and I'm having a lot of fun putting together. It's a pretty good passion project, so I'm happy that I'm able to do content outside of these Pokemon challenges. Because you guys enjoy these, but you know, I also enjoy doing some other stuff and sharing the other facets of Pokemon that you might not know too much about. Anyway, I digress, let's get back into the rival fight. A rock throw one-shots Ghastly leading into Bayleaf. Thanks to Razorleaf being physical though, I should be able to get two screeches off, but apparently he decided to go for Poison Powder first, allowing me to live another turn. Sure, a Razorleaf hits, but I'm free to get in a rock throw that nearly KOs Bayleaf, in which he goes for Poison Powder again, hitting, but I outspeed the land tackle for the KO, leaving just Zubat. I miss for a turn, but next turn I get the one shot with a rock throw, finishing the battle with a complete sweep. Well, that was quite a bit different compared to my last attempt, thank goodness. Maybe third time is the charm. Going through Ilex Forest actually gives me access to Headbutt, a fantastic move for both Geodude and Onyx to replace Tackle, so I'll probably be rocking this for a good while. Heh. <laughs> 
rocking. Alas, nothing else is relevant throughout until Goldenrod, so I hopped over to grab the radio card, edged up, and fought Whitney. She's got two Pokemon, so at least this'll be a fair fight. She leads off with Clefairy, so I go with Geodude, using Rock Throw as she outspeeds, and uses Mimic, failing. Mimic lands next turn, though, to copy Rock Throw, but too late, you're already dead, as Miltank comes in second. Stomp is a bit frustrating here because of the flinch chance, it's 30%, as is Attract, which is a 50% chance to be infatuated, as both of my rocks are male, so I swap into Onyx as Geodude gets hit with Attract, but then Onyx gets hit with Attract. Luckily, I do get two screeches off before the mix of flinching and infatuation sets in, though I do get a nice rock throw in there, pulling her into healing range as Onyx is just too weak to continue. I swap back into my nearly full HP Geodude who's just getting flinched out of this game by Stomp. It's not as crazy as the 9 flinches in a row that I got from Nessa's Aracuda during my Pokemon Sword Steel only Nuzlocke, but it sure is up there, though I do eventually manage to nail two more rock throws to pick up the KO and the win. Well Whitney, you have two options now, either A, you can hand me the badge and the TM and I'll be on my way, or B, well... Wanna cry? Bully Maguire has a point. Crying should help. There's not much between here and Ecritique City, though I do finally have access to my third usable encounter in Sudowoodo. It does hit a bit hard with Low Kick, but I get it on my first Pokeball. Moving back into the few starting areas for some more Eevee training before heading back to Ecritique, since we've got a rival battle in the Burn Tower before I can fight Morty. He leads off with Ghastly, so I went with Onyx, using my newly learned Payback to pick up a one-hit KO, leading to Bayleaf. I also figured here Sandstorm would be the best thing to do because it increases my team's special defense, seeing as Bayleaf is now rocking Magical Leaf. And sure enough, that was the play, as Magical Leaf left Onyx with only 4 HP. But that's fine, since now I can swap into Sudowoodo, take them like a champion, and hit in with Rock Throw as he misses with Poison Powder, KOing with a second Rock Throw as a Poison Powder connects. Magnemite's out third, and easy two shot with Low Kick, though the first one connects actually. The Supersonic stops my plans outright, bringing Sudowoodo down to pretty low health combined with the Poison. So I swapped into Geodude to take it down with Magnitude, unfortunately taking two Sonic Booms in the process, though one of them is half negated thanks to an Orenberry. Last out is Zubat, who starts flinching Geodude to death, followed up by some confusion with Supersonic that's going way too much for me to stay in, so I swapped into my newly acquired team member, Corsola, whom I ran over to Olivine City to grab before this fight. Ice Beam's also available over in the Goldenrod game corner, and since your boy is the king at Voltorb Flip, we got it in hand as well as Surf, taking Zubat down with the former and winning the fight. We may have gotten through the fight, but the emulator's not having it. Our character disappears into thin air, as does everyone else, which I find kind of funny, but thankfully I do remember that my Sudowoodo is poisoned before going all crazy walking around. Morty straight after, and I can't say he's too bad with our current team. Going in 4 vs 4 is pretty fair, and with my defenses and decent offenses, I should be in good shape. First up is Ghastly, whom I've decided to lead Geodude against. I figured if I could set up two rock polishes, I could be able to use Rollout to KO the entire team straight away while outspeeding, barring no misses, but the first turn screws that plan completely, with Lick paralyzing Geodude. Also, yes, I'm keeping it unevolved, only until level 29 though, as Geodude learns Earthquake a lot earlier than either Graveler or Golem do, so it only makes sense. Swapping into Onyx here gives me access to Payback, easily dispatching Ghastly as the big bad Gengar comes into play. Shadow Ball nearly KOs Onyx, but that makes Payback double the power, nearly KOing Gengar in one shot. Really would have been nice to get this devilish bastard out of the way, but alas, we must find another strategy. The Citrus Berry puts him back to just below half HP, so I swap into Sudowoodo, taking a Shadow Ball for well over half, even a Citrus Berry couldn't help make it a two shot. Sadly, I just need a good swap and do a full HP Corsola, so I sacked Sudowoodo here, since it's pretty much useless, just another body to fill out the team, allowing me to get into Corsola and KO with Surf. Unfortunate, but what are you gonna do? Rock types are hard to work with. I need to stop with the puns. Anyway, Hunter's out third, falling to a Surf after using Curse to eliminate half of his own HP, leaving just the second Haunter to be one-shot by Surf after wasting his time with Mean Look. 
Not too bad whatsoever, again, still kind of miffed by Pseudowoodo's death, though I can't say that it would have been too useful for very long beyond this point. I've got two new encounters coming up shortly though, so that should have worked better in niches that Pseudowoodo just can't cover. After all, a pure rock type doesn't give varied options, like a water rock type in Corsola, or a rock bug type that we'll be getting here shortly also is able to do. The next three gym leaders are all rather easy to throw down with in quick succession, so why not? Let's take them down in order. First up is Chuck, whose level cap of 31 makes him the lowest of the three quote, non-linear gym leaders of the Johto region, and even with only two Pokemon, he's still not a pushover, which is a little worrisome. With my newly acquired Chuckle in hand though, I challenge Chuck, leading off with Corsola against his Primeape. This thing is pretty scary. Double Team and Focus Punch are quite the deadly combo if you're able to pull them off, especially against my team who's all weak to fighting, so I figured I'd just lead off with Surf. Get some good damage off either against a Focus Punch that breaks, or perhaps hitting through a Double Team. The latter happens, but he immediately swaps into Polyrath next turn, as it has Water Absorb. Thankfully, I came prepared, since Corsola now has the TM4 Shadow Ball that we got from Morty a little bit ago, giving me a perfect special move to hit neutral damage while also busting focus punches left and right. Polyrath also has Body Slam, so I made sure to have Corsola hold a Lumberry, but this fight actually became free the longer it went on. Shadow Ball just kept getting special defense drops, eventually letting me KO after a Hyper Potion. Speaking of which, thank goodness the AI uses those, it's a great free turn to use Recover instead of risking death with A's Focus Punch. With Polyrath down though, Primeape fills in the slot, getting destroyed by Surf, and earning me the Storm Badge. Uh, Storm Badge? This is a fighting gym. I mean, sure, he uses a Polyrath, but like, we're in Gen 2. They should have been able to come up with a more original name for a fighting badge at this point. As for the other two, Price is up next with a cap of 34, though we have to get through the rocket hideout to do so. It's not too bad, and I don't even think the fights against Petrol or the double battle between myself and Lance against the Grunt and Ariana are necessarily worth talking about. They're kind of just filler, as are most rocket fights with the exception of Archer at the end of the radio tower, which we'll be getting to soon. But even then, he only has three Pokemon. It really is nothing crazy. Alas, with them cleared out, I'm able to take on the Cold Geezer. I swear, these puns are coming right off the top of my head. They call me the Punster, baby! Price leads off with a Sneasel, so I go with my newly evolved Graveler, using Earthquake to take it down in one shot, leading to Dugong. Now this thing is going for Aurora Beam, which doesn't do jack all to Shuckle, so I swap, hit it with a Sludge Bomb, and get the poison on the first attack. Pretty lucky if I do say so myself, but now I can swap between that and Protect to whittle this thing's HP down, and get Price to waste a healing item. Shuckle's also got a Lumberry on it to make Rest an easy recovery, and once I see Rest come from Dugong itself, I know now is my chance to strike. I used Encore to lock him into Rest, leaving me to get a free swap into Graveler, using Rock Polish and three rollouts on Dugong to get the easy KO, leaving just Piloswine to get dumpstered in one critical shot, winning me the Glacier Badge and the victory. Now, this makes sense for a nice badge. It's named the Glacier Badge. It's not the frickin' Storm Badge. What the hell was wrong with these game developers? Anyway, I'm just happy I was able to clutch that out because both subtypes I'm weak to, both water and ground. And, you know, Encore plus straight-up power stab moves, those you can't really go wrong with. As for the last gym leader before the Radio Tower mess, Jasmine is finally accessible after giving Ampharos the Secret Potion, and since our level cap is 35, I found it a good time to evolve Graveler into Golem, giving me a great tool for this fight. She's got two Magnemites, neither of which have Levitate and a Steelix, so Earthquake is going to hose this team, one-shotting her first Magnemite and getting Golem to level 36 in preparation for Steelix. Boulder Golem here hits 4 over half with Earthquake, procking the Citrus Berry in the process of taking an Iron Tail for less than half, but another Earthquake seals the deal on Steelix, leaving just the second Magnemite to fall to an obvious Earthquake. This wins me the Mineral Badge, and all we're missing is the Rising Badge, and I really don't feel like going through the Rocket stuff to get it, but I guess we have to do it. But for the sake of talking about the most important battles, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the rival fight in the underground. 
Boober is here once again and ready to fight as Golbat comes out to combat Golem here, but it doesn't really matter all that much, seeing as Air Cutter doesn't do much and Rollout does over half with the first attack. Sadly, I kind of forgot about my held item here, not using a Lumberry and being punished by the Confuse Ray. Not a problem though, I can swap out into Onyx and hit it with two Baybacks to KO, taking less than half as Sneasel comes in second. Hilariously enough, Rock Smash is quad super effective on Sneasel, but it's such a bad move that it's still a two shot, taking it out after a few faint attacks land and leading into the big bad Meganium. Thankfully though, I can now combat this effectively as I swapped into my newly evolved Meg Cargo, finally gaining the rock typing and allowing me to stall out his pedal dance, firing off Lava Plume as he hits himself in confusion, KOing in one shot. Haunter's out here second to last, firing off a Shadow Ball for slightly less than half, but Lava Plume once again puts in enough work to KO, leaving just Magnemite to fall to a Lava Plume, despite the attempted stall with Paralysis. Having a Fire-type Pokemon is such a help for Rock-types, it's weird to hear, but when you consider that Grass-types are one of those main types that you're quad weak against, it's very nice to have something to combat them with. Now, only if there was a Grass-Rock-type before the post-game that I could use to counter Water-types. Cough, cough, cray dilly. Afterwards, I'm able to finish up the rocket takeover of the radio tower, taking out Proton with relative ease as his Golbat falls to Pupitar's Rock Slide, the one that I got over in the Safari Zone of course, and Weezing's just a few clicks of the same move away from going down. Ariana, who takes a wee bit more time but still has Arbok fall to Golem's Earthquake, Vileplume to an Earthquake and Lava Plume. Seriously, I have no idea why I left Golem out here to hit Earthquake aside from the fact that Vileplume was very underleveled and Ancient Power to take out Murkrow from a cargo. One more dumbass to go and that's Archer, and for being the surrogate boss for Team Rocket in Gen 2, his whole team just falls to one surf apiece from Corsola, felling Houndour, Houndoom, and coughing to win the match. See you later when you try this plan again in an alternate universe very similar to this one where the only choice I make differently is to use some other type of Pokemon. <sighs> man. Anyway, after all that awfully easy crap, there's really nothing much to talk about outside of doing the normal story events to get to Blackthorn City, the home of Claire's Gym Battle. Corsola Stall is the name of the game here, using Recover and Ancient Power to outlast her Gyarados, KOing in two shots with Ancient Power and leading into Dragonair. Dragon Pulse comes out immediately for minimal damage as Ice Beam nearly KOs, bringing her into healing range and allowing me to hit another Ice Beam as she uses a full restore, though in hindsight I could have gotten Recover off this turn instead of risking the critical hit next turn. At this point though, I'm just outpacing Dragonair's damage output thanks to Recover, since I need to ensure that I survive at least one of Kingdra's Hydro Pumps. I need to make sure that I do that, as well as get through the second Dragonair that does the same thing, spamming Dragon Pulse until something happens, with that something being her death, leaving just the Kingdra. Corsal is sitting at 77 HP here, and plenty enough for Hydro Pump to land for half damage and allow for Recover to heal it off. I have to risk two criticals here though, and if I don't want any deaths, I'm going to, which Corsola does manage to survive, using three recovers to offset those hydro pumps, then letting me go into Shuckle to absorb the last two, though she switches her strategy into using Smoke Screen. She even predicts my Protect turn, using another Smoke Screen before going to Hydro Pump on the next turn and doing well over half as my Berry Juice heals 20 more damage. Though, she does go for the fifth as I use Protect, making this initially menacing dragon fresh meat in the eyes of Golem, one-shotting with a critical earthquake after I swapped into it, winning me the battle. Really should have had Surf instead of Hydro Pump, I guess. PowerPoint stall became a legitimate strategy because of that. Anyway, skipping all of the dumb story stuff, we've got half a dozen battles before the Hall of Fame, but while our rival challenges us for the final time before the League, I'd like to give a quick plug to my buddy Nick Noir and his channel Power On. He recently picked back up content creation, and I was on his newest video talking about the Xbox Game Pass. It's actually kind of shocking how many games are on there that I would be interested in, despite Xbox usually having the image of gritty shooter console and not much else. Definitely open it in a new tab and check it out after we finish the run, link is in the description. Anyway, Sneasel just dies to Iron Tail from Onyx, nothing you missed there, as does Magneton to Earthquake, though this does take a few seconds since I forgot if this one had Levitate or not. It does not, so now we're caught up. 
Meganium's out third, and it's either Shuckle or Macargo here. And stalling out with Petal Dance until Meganium confuses itself with Shuckle sounds like a pretty legitimate strategy to me. So I swapped, hit a few Sludge Bombs while a Citrus Berry kept him healthy, eventually leading to the duo of Poison and Confusion doing a good chunk of damage. Meganium's almost down, so I figured I'd just go for rest to heal up the half HP Shuckle's missing before Meganium goes down, but I guess my luck runs out here, finally falling to one of those fabled critical hits that seems to happen to every Nuzlocker when they don't play around them. I guess I'm just a little bit luckier in these instances. Either way, Shuckle's loss doesn't do anything in the grand scheme of things with the Elite Four, so I don't care. Swapping into Onyx and KOing with Earthquake is probably my best bet because it's the only thing that outspeeds Meganium on my team. Half of his team remains as fourth is Haunter. Nothing too crazy, just needs two rock throws to take it out. Made easily done thanks to a Lumberry negating his Confuse Ray. Fifth is Kadabra, outspeeding and using Disable on Rock Throw. And thankfully I predicted this, swapping to Earthquake to KO in one shot with just Golbat remaining. Despite Rock Throw still being disabled, I figured I'd at least give Iron Tail a shout, and I actually got almost a one shot through Confusion with a critical hit, though it is just shy. Onyx has amazing defense though, so I just kept clicking A until Iron Tail finally connected for the second time, KOing and winning me the fight. Now that we're ready for the league, I replace Shuckle with Rhydon thanks to that new encounter in the Victory Road, which just leaves some item and TM collecting for preparation. Time boosting items, TMs to swap out with each other, and Move Relearner and Blackthorn were all used here, and you'll see how this fares in due time. First up is Will, and I've got a decently clean-cut strategy for him. Using Rhydon, I can bait out a U-turn with his Zatu so that he'll swap into Slow Bro for type advantage, and by using Swords Dance on that turn and following up with Shadow Claw, I can easily pick up that KO with no risk of being outsped and KO'd myself. Second out is Jinx, well, technically third, but second to die to Shadow Claw. Zatu's back in and uses Psychic for exactly half of my remaining HP, going down to Shadow Claw and just leaving two members. Executor is a pretty easy swap out, but not because it has a grass type move. In fact, it doesn't. It's just the special attack on this gal is too high for Rhydon to survive, as is the case for Macargo, taking a wee bit over half as it gets swapped in. I try going for Golem here to see if I can get at least an attack in, but again, slightly over half. Pipitar is the only thing I've been able to swap in here and use a move without dying, using Crunch twice as she sets up Reflect, but two Psychics pulls him down to 12 HP. I'm getting low on options, so I swap into Onyx in on an Egg Bomb because of Pupitar's low HP. Executor sees the KO with that rather than a Psychic, taking a small bit of damage and firing off Earthquake for a similarly small chunk before Psychic pulls him down into the single digits. I've got to go into Corsola here, and thankfully, he finally decides to go for Hypnosis, procking my Lumberry on Corsola and giving me a free turn to go for Ice Beam, KOing and leveling up my entire team to level 48 thanks to the EXP split. Last out is the second Zatu, going down to an Ice Beam after using Psychic for rather minimal damage. Corsola's just heckin' bulky, I guess. Second on my docket is Koga, who's not too hard thanks to Macargo. Ariados has Giga Drain, so it was probably my best bet to lead with it, setting up Light Screen as Spider Web comes down, trapping me in as I use Flamethrower to KO next turn after taking a Light Poison Jab. It has a bit higher power than Lava Plume, and I figured I was going to need all the extra oomph I could get for any of these fights, and sure enough it does come in handy. Flamethrower KOs Fortress after stalling for a turn with Protect, leading to Venomoth, who outspeeds and uses Toxic, Unfortunately, it lands, but Flamethrower picks up the KO instantly afterwards. Light Screen wears off as Muck comes in, and I figured I'd at least get one more disruption off before swapping, using Yawn as he uses Minimize, then swapping into Golem as he uses a second Minimize, putting him to sleep between turns. This gives me two turns minimum to hit an Earthquake, but turns out I only need one, KOing instantly and leaving just Crobat. Golem's the perfect out here too, as Rollout is able to start the KOing process, but a double team does put a wrench in my plans here, making the second hit of rollout miss. It's probably better if I pop over to the 100% accurate headbutt here, and though it forces him into using a full restore after two of them, here I can just use rollout once more, thankfully not missing and KOing with two shots of it. Also, yeah, I guess there were wing attacks coming down from Crobat. Not that I could notice because they didn't do anything. Bruno's third and we're gonna have to use his own dumb Pokemon against him to sweep. 
Hitmontop is a stupid Pokemon, and for some reason likes to prioritize counter over triple kick. And Dig is a two turn move, so by replacing my Iron Tail with Protect on Onyx, I can use both Curse to raise my attack and defense, as well as Rock Polish to replenish my lost speed, while also making it so Onyx can outspeed his entire team and nail everything with Earthquake. Sure, this takes 12 turns to completely set up all three sats to plus sticks, but Hitmontop just keeps going for counter, expecting me to attack one day, and I oblige after five curses and five rock polishes. Sweeping through the entire team with one earthquake each on Hitmontop, Hitmonlee, Hitmonchan, Machamp, and his own Onyx, easily picking up the victory. Did not expect that I'd be using an Onyx to sweep in a Pokemon game, but I guess here we are. In fact, Onyx is a perfect sweeping tool for Karen, but requires a little bit more setup. By using my cargo to use both Yawn and Reflect, I can swap into Onyx afterwards, then begin the setup. Though of course it wouldn't be a chaotic meatball video without an errant critical doing too much damage and me remaining stubborn to the game plan, setting up through paybacks and feint attacks, with double teams coming from Umbreon that'll make Earthquake a pain to hit, though these 12 turns are definitely worth it. Also, in case if you're curious as to how Onyx has Iron Tail back, it's actually a TM as well as a level up move, so saving the TM for this strategy exactly was pretty smart. Eventually, after taking over half damage from this Umbreon, I'm able to hit Earthquake on the first try through six double teams. I think it was six, I didn't really count. Pretty based, all things considered, KOing and leading into Vileplume, who goes down just as well. Gengar's out third, being outsped and KO'd with Iron Tail, as Houndoom comes in fourth and falls to Earthquake. Last out is Murkrow, so Iron Tail's the perfect way to cap off the fight, with a Salt in the Wound critical hit to finish her off, leaving just Lance. Just Lance? What about Ganto? That's probably what you're asking. Well, it's uh, not in this video. Truth is, I need a way to help achieve my goal this year of hitting 10,000 Twitter followers, so the entirety of the Kanto region will be posted exclusively over there by the end of this week. You want to see the other region? Go over there and give the account a follow, link is in the description. And if we hit 3,000 followers over there by the end of this month, I'll go ahead and give away 5 copies of Pokemon Legends Arceus. Anyway, getting into the champion battle before I give people another reason to try to eviscerate me in the comments like they usually do, Gyarados is Lance's lead. And Corsola is quite frankly the only thing that can stand up to it. Waterfall is the only water type move he has, and by stalling this out I can effectively sweep later. So by giving Corsola Reflect over Shadow Ball, I can set that up easier, then alternate between Recover and Ice Beam to wear him down and get Lance to waste full restores, while also keeping a held Lepaberry so that Recover cannot physically run out of power points before he runs out of Waterfalls. I do get the first full restore out of him by the same turn that Reflect ends, so I set up a second, going for Surf this time as Ice Beam's power points are going to be much more vital to taking out all three of his Dragonites. Though, weirdly enough, as he swaps into one of them upon the first use of Surf, allowing me a turn to use Recover to get to full HP before taking a massive Thunder from it. Not a problem, didn't paralyze, so Ice Beam can easily pick up the one-shot KO here. Well, now the sweep setup on Gyarados is going out the window, so it's time to go into Winget mode, and Winget mode always shows that I cannot physically improvise in a Pokemon game without being a stubborn idiot. Yeah, I went into Mag Cargo to take Blizzard initially, but instead I see Dragon Rush doing slightly less than half, and because it does slightly less than half, I figured I'd try PowerPoint stalling him with Recover. But nope, it also flinches, so Mag Cargo's out of the running. Swapping it a ride on to take one of these seems smart, but somehow he predicts that switch. Not really, he probably just sees a KO here and used a random move, using Blizzard and immediately one-shotting my ride on. So much for seeing Bright Perrier in the post-game, I've never used one of those. I drag out Onyx in the attempt to wear out his Blizzard power points, but he hits a second in a row, KOing in another one-shot. I'm down two Pokemon, so swapping into Pupitar is my next option, surviving a Blizzard and hitting Rock Slide for over half. Well, I'm in a great position, he's hit three in a row, which gives me the statistically higher advantage in him missing the fourth, and never mind, Pupitar is dead. Really wanted to use Tyranitar. Four in a row, wish I was that lucky with Blizzard myself. Alas, the fifth does end up missing on Golem, using Rock Polish to set up some speed over his team, then using Rollout for an attempted impromptu sweep, taking out his Dragonite in two hits, Gyarados on the third, his Ace Dragonite on the fourth, and Charizard on the fifth, leaving just Aerodactyl. 
Well, this thing shouldn't be able to touch Golem easily, so I just used Rollout again, picking up the KO with three hits of it after tanking two crunches and bumping him into full restore range. This wins me the fight, but boy howdy, that did not end well. Thankfully, we'll have some new encounters over in Kanto to pick up, so make sure to head on over to twitter.com slash chaoticmeatball to check that out. Should have that out by the end of this week. Anyway, shoutouts to my $5 and above patrons, Arantula, Aaron Ladeau, Aiden Brannon, Andy, Austin Rose, Box of Turtles, Casper Kirkpatrick, Cryptic Gamer, Heimflow, Jacob Johnson, Justin Dimenstein, Leon Metalg, Zeno, and Zachary Kiever. You guys help support this channel so much, and I appreciate it. Thanks for watching, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you guys next time.